happen to a chair the uh, panel discussion. But please ask that you all put your phones to silent so they don't disturb us, although there's many of the free working people who respond, so I won't squeeze those few that have to be come on. Um, but we'd appreciate if you keep it to the, the minimum noise that you can. Thank you very much. We'll be starting soon. Thank you, Mark. Shall we? Is an I certainly digitally past four. <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. A really warm uh, welcome to this uh, panel session on uh, IMO's uh, emissions uh, targets. Uh, this is a really a great honor for me to chair this session. Uh, and. Uh, my, my role in uh, Aqualis Bremer LLC is as uh, Chief Energy Transition Officer. So this is in the heart of what I have to do. So hopefully uh, I've, uh, I can stir you up with some uh, thoughts that I, I would like to discuss through the, uh, the next hour. Um, unfortunately, I've got to start with an uh, apology that uh, one of my colleagues, Paul Hill, who was supposed to be here, is not here uh, because of uh, some other commitment. But uh, I have a secret, but uh, I know we are amongst friends. Don't tell him. I've got a very good panelist in replacement who knows quite a lot about alternative energies uh, and, uh, al sorry, alternative technologies and energies for shipping. So uh, we should have an interesting uh, discussion. Uh, and that's what I had planned to say. Then I heard that another one of my panelists uh, fell sick. So, and that was to deal with the ports and harbors side. So can I um, kind of uh, rely on ports and harbor specialists here at the right moment to chip in and say what we should uh, talk about? Uh, and uh, you could think of a positive way of looking at that whole uh, thing, and that is that we might finish a little earlier and we can get to the drinks much more quickly. Is that right, Katie? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So, we are going to discuss four topics, which I think we've kind of uh, outlined uh, to in the various invitations. So, in terms of emissions reduction for shipping, what is the crux of the issue? And I'll be asking the panelists uh, when they introduce themselves to also give their flavor of that crux, because I think it's important that uh, uh, we s provoke you early and uh, keep you keep. Uh, matters in your head uh, for us to argue over later on. The second question we had asked was, how are the regulatory framework and private initiatives shaping the market ahead? And we'll discuss that uh, after we've had the introductions. And the third is, what are the marine technologies and alternative fuels out there today, and how effective are they towards the targets? And the fourth one, which is to look at beyond the maritime, uh, maritime beyond the vessel. I mean, because we are, uh, the IMO only looks at the vessels. But we were trying to look at a holistic view of what we can do to help ports and harbor emissions reductions, and what can ports and harbors to, to, uh, uh, do to reduce uh, vessel emissions by smarter planning. So we'll have a discussion on that topic, and I'm sure uh, there are probably more uh, august people who can actually contribute to that during uh, the meeting. So before we launch uh, into, the, into the discussion, I wanted to give an outline of my uh, view of the current situation, which is uh, I'd like to highlight the, the loftiness of the goals the shipping industry has been set in our search towards decarbonization and mitigating climate change, which I think is the defining uh, problem for our century. So uh, I think we should all be proud that we have the opportunity today to be able to work in this area to try to improve that, uh, that situation. And shipping is a particularly difficult area. Hard, I think it's, uh, along with aviation, known as the hard to abate sector. Uh, we can probably name a few others. I won't go into them at the moment. But certainly the hard to abate sector, uh, uh, which is maritime, and that is the, the heart of some of the discussions. But 
in the time that I've spent talking to my colleagues and uh, the panel, fellow panel members and so on, I have actually come to uh, look at, I think that we should attack this topic with optimism and certainty. Because one thing is clear, and that is that even when the energy transition has come and gone and the oil and gas industry is no longer there, maritime will still be there. It is, it has been thus since the dawn of civilization. So we have everything to play <coughs> for in this area. So I would love to, I, I mean, if one wants to have a mission in life when you are trying to do work, that is clearly a mission in life to, to, make, to do this. But before I go into the, 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 the details of uh, the, the discussion, I wanted to actually say, what is the target? And I think uh, it's quite crazy how, the, how vaguely targets are defined and how uh, loosely people interpret them. So I wanted to put it down as hard as possible as to what it is now. So the major target that we have is greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 50% against 2008 numbers by 2050. And it is not CO2. The reason I say that is that, unfortunately, when I look at the emissions statistics, the non-CO2 emissions have grown disproportionately. And those non-CO2 emissions, meaning methane, and uh, nitrous oxide, those have global warming potentials that are much worse than carbon dioxide. So what I don't want our industry to do is to solve uh, a problem and cause an even bigger problem. So we should keep in mind, and I think IMO was wise to put the GHG as the, as the position, but therefore we should keep that particular target as a GHG emissions reduction target. Why is this emissions reduction so hard to do? So I thought I, uh, I had a picture. Uh, you might be able to, uh, do, do we have a chance? Um, right. So the, the picture that I, I had here, and I'll probably move out of the way, um, is that uh, having said this bit about GHG and CO2, if you look at the fourth GHG report from uh, IMO, it actually puts the, the, the y-axis is CO2 emissions. So even they have fallen into the confusion trap. But nevertheless, the, the point is that there has been some very nice simulations of economic uh, development over the next 30 years. Whether you take OECD view, whether you take IPCC, World Economic Forum, it probably doesn't matter. But some of these simulations, when you play those simulations out, the emissions are actually increasing. So you can see all the colors. Forget the red one for the moment. The, the, all the colors are either, at best, we have about 10% reduction. At worst, we have a 60% increase over 2008. That's why I think this is a hard area to play. And, and the red actually shows what IMO has set itself and set uh, its stakeholders to achieve over the next 30 years round, in round numbers. So the problem is clear. It's big. Uh, I'm a mathematical nerd, so I like a picture like that, uh, which tells me what the problem is without any doubt. Uh, I, I think, actually, unfortunately, the problem may be a little bit worse because of the, the, the uh, uh, greenhouse gas question, but I'll get to that at some point. Uh, after this uh, debate, and maybe some of you can tell me what the right numbers are. They are bloody hard to get otherwise. So um, I, I think it's a, it's a pretty hard area to, uh, to uh, drive forward. However, I do think, I think uh, just looking at the kind of projects that uh, we are getting asked to look at uh, and, the, and the kind of uh, uh, foreground to which the whole of this business has got to uh, in terms of uh, global warming and the recognition and almost uh, complete consensus gives me great confidence that I think we have the means to get there. Uh, and I won't say two very quick things which are extra bits that I didn't 
think about, but one that actually David mentioned, which reminded me, which was the part is that when you look at from today to 2050, electrification is going to be massive. And what is good about electrification is that it's efficient. Now we waste quite a lot of efficiency. Uh, in, uh, we destroy energy effectively before we can actually use them. So I think the two together, has, plus the commitment, I, I feel that we are in a position to get that. But it's not going to be easy, and that's why we've got this discussion. And I'm hoping that you will all get uh, very uh, engaged in that uh, discussion. And uh, uh, hopefully we can, uh, uh, although don't destroy my optimism. That's all I ask. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully we should actually have that optimism to, to get there. So uh, maybe I'll kick off by asking David, would you, would you introduce yourself and also uh, just tell us what is bothering you as far as this whole topic is? What is the crux of your matter? You. Um, and those of you who don't know me, David Hanley, I am um, with the Watson family in Williams. I've been a lawyer now 13 years, um, or in the practice of law for 13 years. We forgive you. Yes, uh, it's a cross <laughs> that we have to bear. Um, and before that, I spent over a decade driving cruise ships for a living. So I've seen both sides of the industry. And for me, the, the crux of the, 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 this particular issue, uh, as with many issues uh, to do with um, shipping, is the lack of visibility of shipping. Uh, most people, if you stop them in the streets, will be able to identify who Amazon or John Lewis or Tesco are, certainly in this jurisdiction. Um, it will be much more difficult for people to identify who MSC or Maersk or CMA, CGM are. Yet they're probably as present in our daily lives as the brands that I mentioned uh, prior to that. And the, the, the issue is that we don't look at the problem holistically. What we're doing is we're identifying hiving off issues. So the greenhouse gas emissions, that, those are emissions for propelling the ship forward. It doesn't deal with the emissions of building the ship and uh, the production uh, and fabrication of steel is one of the most carbon intensive industries on the planet and it doesn't deal with the recycling of the ship at the end of its life cycle. In the same way that most people that go and buy grapes from Chile in the supermarket in November don't appreciate how much carbon has gone uh, into actually bringing that product to your shelves, not only through the agriculture but from actually transporting it. I think. If we are to, 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 to deal with this as, a, uh, as an industry, we've got to be more visible. The supply chain has to be better understood, and I think one of the um, perhaps um, interesting side effects of the pandemic and the shortages that it's caused on the supermarket shelves is there is a starting to be a little bit of a, a more visibility um, in terms of, of, uh, of shipping. Uh, but certainly not to the extent that, that we need the public to understand <coughs> when they're making purchase choices. The reality is, if we're going to solve this, I'm afraid to tell everyone in the room, your life is going to be more expensive. There's no two ways about it. Um, and it's about us realising that and being prepared to pay for, I think um, uh, Bill Gates calls them as gr green levies or, or, or green premiums. Um, which are a result of the additional cost for um, the, the, the infrastructure change that needs to take place. I think we should debate that, how expensive question. I'll ask these guys <coughs> what their views are. So that, I, uh, thank you very much, David. That's, uh, I think it's very clear. Uh, uh, we are also avoiding, to some extent, the, the life cycle cost uh, yeah. element to it. Uh, partly because I suspect some of that cost is actually inside the governmental situation, so IMO uh, is not uh, responsible for it. But I, I take your point from a global perspective, yeah. absolutely. And um, Dave, uh, George, maybe, the next one, uh, my colleague from uh, Aqualis Brain Mile, let's see. Uh, thank you, Akilan, and uh, thank you all for uh, making it here with us on, uh, on a rainy day. I am uh, George Savopoulos. Uh, my uh, background before joining ABL was uh, civil engineering and uh, in particular the design, planning and uh, construction of ports. <coughs> Since I joined uh, ABL uh, three years ago, I had the chance to uh, delve into one of my personal interests, which uh, was decarbonization. I uh, co-developed a portal application 
that uh, was intended uh, to achieving the implementation of the Poseidon principles and uh, addressing the uh, conflicts and contradictions with uh, uh, the initial uh, consumption. And uh, for the past uh, year and a half, uh, I've been uh, coordinating the uh, uh, due diligence uh, consultancy that we offer on uh, emissions and uh, the uh, reduction of carbon. So. Uh, my area mostly data and uh, the accounting side of carbon and then using the uh, help from uh, my expert colleagues trying to convert this into actual solutions and uh, plans and uh, useful advisory. Uh, when it comes to the crux of the issue from the data side of things, the, uh, the one thing that uh, appears to be crucial for me is that we all know that uh, there has been a lot of uh, work performed uh, by the IMO and other international organizations on achieving a carbon reduction, setting the targets and uh, uh, coming up with a procedure on how to get there. However, at this stage, all we know is, all we can be certain of is uh, where we need to be by uh, 2026. And we have a suspicion or we can have a good guesstimate of where we want to be in 2030. And that leaves us with another two decades of uh, uncharted uh, targets. And uh, I think this is affecting the uh, industry, both in terms of uh, making the right decisions forward, about exploring the right options, and the landscape uh, when it comes to decarbonization and uh, the available solutions is much more complex than uh, the binary issue between a scrubber or a non-scrubber option that we faced uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the second crux, and I'll step in... Oh, uh, two crux. Excellent. Yes, I'll, uh, I'll step in on uh, what uh, Paul Martin would probably talk about if he was here. It has to do with the fact that uh, we are currently looking at emissions only at the vessel level, and we are kind of ignoring at the time what happens beyond the vessel itself. So can we get some help, or can we transfer part of what we do to uh, the ports and harbors? Or when we are talking about fuels, is how the fuels get all the way to our bunkers. What is the process of extracting them? Uh, what is the process of uh, uh, moving the fuel? So a ton of uh, VLSFO, for instance, uh, is not as carbon heavy. It's not the same, doesn't have the same carbon weight as another ton, depending on where they came from and how they ended up uh, to our bunkers. I think <coughs> these are the two key issues. OK. Thank you very much, uh, George. That's excellent. I hope uh, you'll stir up to ask some difficult questions later on. Um, Dean, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I'm Dean Goves. I am a Managing Director in Longitude Engineering, which is part of the Aqualis Braemar LOC Group. Uh, my focus is on vessel design and, and alteration. And uh, to that end, I think the, the parts of the issue that are closest to me are, are the practical implementation um, of some of these technologies uh, into vessels uh, and the, uh, the impact on their, their operation. Um, and the cost, uh, both for, for purchase and, and the running cost, um, and how that works into something that is actually a viable solution that can be adopted. Um, I think coupled to that uh, is the supporting infrastructure that needs to be in place, um, and how that is going to develop alongside uh, the implementation of those solutions uh, on our vessels. Okay, excellent, thanks. Good. Um, Please keep a note of any um, questions that you have for us, um, because it will be interesting to uh, not get have group think from one side. Um, and uh, ah, right. Uh, uh, can you hear me at the back? Or should I speak a bit more? Ah, right. Okay. So I, I, I was just going to say, please keep keep a note of some questions for us, because I'm sure it'll be uh, interesting to debate it so that we don't end up with the group think of uh, the panel. Uh, but uh, I'll start by turning to the uh, first of the three remaining questions we've got, which is really, uh, my question relates to, it's a really carrot or a stick. What works best? And do I need both? And that, I guess, I would like to ask George, who's been working on this topic for a while with the Poseidon principles, which is probably, in my view, the carrot. And I'm sure there are loads of sticks around as well. Uh, thank you. So I think the first and uh, direct effect of uh, uh, regulations on uh, decarbonization is the fact that uh, we are here uh, talking about it and having this conversation. And 
Yeah, we have noticed that uh, the London International Shipping Week is being dominated uh, by emissions okay. and uh, alternative fuels this year, and that's a good succession from uh, the Schulbur Cup that uh, has been the topic of debate uh, over the past uh, last couple of years. Uh, in this case, we are dealing with a much more uh, complex issue, of course, and uh, I think that the main reason that uh, it's currently as heavily debated is that uh, it's, uh, whilst it's been discussed uh, for uh, over a decade, uh, almost a decade and a half, it's something that's new in the actual uh, market side of uh, the industry. So the Poseidon principles were uh, indeed a catalyst. They brought the emissions game and actually uh, working to uh, achieve a specific target at the uh, vessel or portfolio level uh, uh, about a year and a half ago. So it became a topic of discussion. The upcoming uh, regulation uh, from the IMO has also been a catalyst, and of course, uh, initiatives like the Sea Cargo Charter that followed uh, the Poseidon Principles and uh, the upcoming uh, insurers Poseidon Principles that we expect uh, the launch of uh, in the next month. The IMO itself uh, uh, has uh, looked at this issue in uh, the short term, and we all understand how complex is. Uh, to get uh, consensus in uh, what to implement when it comes to regulation, and especially in such complex and uh, demanding matters. We now know that uh, we will be looking at vessels on the basis of uh, five performance categories, from A to E, in which C, which is the middle one, will represent what uh, a vessel is expected, uh, how a vessel is expected to perform. And uh, that uh, stems out from a calculated formula for the performance uh, in uh, for uh, 2019, on which we start applying reducing uh, factors on each onward year from 2023 to uh, 2026. We are yet not certain, but we suspect what may happen up to 2030, but uh, there is no guidance uh, on uh, what happens uh, in the medium term or long term as we approach uh, 2050. Uh, Another interesting development over the summer was uh, the fact that uh, the European Union is uh, now uh, announcing that uh, it will uh, make shipping part of the emissions uh, trading scheme, and uh, their ambition is uh, a much steeper reduction, trying to achieve the 50% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030. And uh, to me, the risk of uh, talking about an emissions trading scheme is that unless we can uh, promptly adapt our industry and uh, develop and embrace the technologies that will take us there, we'll find ourselves uh, trading emissions with other industries and effectively paying a levy to a different industry to regulate or offset uh, our own emissions. So it's taking investment away from shipping and into random other industries that uh, will be handling this uh, capital. Uh, I think this very much uh, sums up uh, where we are with the regulatory framework. The fact that we don't have a long-term outline or roadmap on or that uh, we need to follow makes it extremely difficult. I mean, we all know that uh, the uh, life of an asset is uh, in excess of 20 years. Even for existing assets, it's uh, difficult for an investor, for an owner, and uh, particularly for a small uh, vessel owner with uh, two or three or four assets that does not have the uh, comfort, if you like, of hedging between different options to select what is right and uh, plan their medium-term or long-term uh, strategy. Yeah. Actually, something that I'm, uh, when I read through the IMO stuff uh, that I get worried about is the fact that there is this big target to 2050, but all the short-term targets are to do with carbon intensity and not the total uh, emissions reduction. Or am I wrong? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, you mean I'm the quietest person here? Oh, sorry, terrible. <laughs> this, this is terrible. No, my, my question was that it looks like that a lot of the, um, the targets that we have are kind of 2050 targets for emissions reduction. Uh, and then when you, have, when you look at short-term targets of 2030 or 2035, I think, uh, they're all intensity targets, which actually... Ultimately, because global warming is to do with uh, cumulative emissions, they don't really solve the problem. 
So I want something that uh, uh, that gives me a roadmap. Oh, you, maybe you said you, no, you said it. Uh, in my opinion, it is yeah. a sensible approach on uh, the grounds that uh, the essence of carbon intensity is uh, relating uh, carbon emissions to the amount of work produced. So uh, if we were just looking at uh, the production of carbon and measuring it or accounting it, we could still measure how much fuel a vessel burned and understand what the emissions okay. were. But we need to have a means of relating it to what the society, the sector got as a benefit out of uh, yeah. emitting this. And Agreed. I mean, there is no perfect way to do it even now, but uh, I, thi I think having these indica indicators, like the annual efficiency ratio, which looks at uh, uh, the vessel's capacity and nautical miles covered, or uh, uh, in the case of the Sea Cargo Charter, uh, the OI, which uh, looks at uh, the uh, amount of uh, product transported and the mileage uh, it covered, does help in terms of gaining a perspective and addressing uh, uh, carbon reduction uh, to the right place. Excellent. It isn't, it isn't. David, I, I, I was going to say, you will have a very uh, <laughs> unique perspective, having been on uh, both sides of this shipping thing, regulatory as well as the people who want to have carbon, to people who want to have uh, carrot. Yeah. You have been on the carrot side and the... I, I have, mm. so uh, just picking up on something George said, yeah. um, modern aviation is spectacularly efficient. In fact, if you look at the carbon, per mile. Part of carbon efficiency, you're better off getting on a plane than you are on almost any Absolutely. vehicle on the road. But vehicles on the road weren't designed to do 10,000 miles in 17 hours. Yes. You know, that's the point. It's, yes. So that's why it's carbon efficiency. But I think the, uh, sorry, carbon intensity, that's yeah. actually the, the important measure. But I, in terms of, of, of carrot and, and stick, I, you know, having been on the operational side of things, I don't think it really matters to most people driving ships how carbon intense they are, other than their personal interest in, in um, their family lives and impact it has on uh, th their future. But uh, from our point of view, um, and this is why the work that Watson Farley did on the Poseidon principles uh, was so interesting, was that um, the stick really th that I see existing is really with, with, with the money. The, the stick in terms of the regulators, uh, unfortunately most governments haven't got their house in order in exactly what they wanted to do, including <coughs> ours. Um, and shipping's a very difficult uh, industry to regulate, as, as we know. I mean, uh, shipping's done a wonderful job with the port state control uh, in inspections uh, in making them safer, but that's a gain that's come over 30 years. You know, So if we're going to start enforcing uh, carbon efficiency, who's going to do it? Who's going to have the jurisdiction to do it? Yeah. Um, so the reality is, I think a lot of the early gains are going to be from the investment banks and financiers impo imposing limits on the amount of carbon intensity that an owner can have, you know, encouraging them to d design efficient vessels rather than just buy the cheapest one off the shelf to, to keep running for 20 years. Okay, thank you. So those who can uh, kind of provide the carrot but are coming with the stick are the ones who will solve the problem. I, I, I don't see it. I think that it, it's all a carrot. Right okay. Okay, um, Dean, because I know that you worked very uh, hard on the IMO 2020 uh, changes that were going on and the scrubber uh, scenario. What is your view on the, uh, on, the, on the question of carrot or stick or both? Sure, sure. I mean, I think I can be uh, a brief on that one to say I think we need to avoid the fiasco that was the scrubber situation. Um, you know, no clear direction on, on which way to go, and ultimately people made investment decisions that, that then were, were proved uh, fruitless. Um, and I think that is, uh, is, is uh, we've already said, it's a very difficult industry to regulate, and I don't think there's any silver bullets, as there, as there rarely, rarely are. Uh, if, we, if, we, if there were, we would have used them. Um, but for, from my perspective as a designer, certainly incentivizing the, the upfront investment in these technologies is... Uh, uh, th either through uh, regulation through the stick or through uh, demonstrating a return on investment um, through the carrot approach is uh, I think you've got to have both combined um, and I don't think there are any easy answers. Okay, very good. Thank you. I don't know, do we want to um, uh, have any comments from anybody on, the, on this first question, although we can come back to that later on? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, the UK government 
Government said yesterday that they were going to gain work behind them. I've been told off now. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, that, that was the plan. But, um, uh, but I, I thought that the, the discussion was uh, sufficiently interesting. I didn't want to move off too fast. But maybe you were getting us there, which is the, uh, m the technologies and alternate fuels. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective on uh, available things as well as the effectiveness of uh, various uh, tools that you have at your disposal? Yeah. Okay. I'll stand up. This one's probably yes. a bit of a longer answer. Yes, I think. Um, uh, well, I think uh, in terms of available um, fuels, uh, alternate fuels, uh, and also other uh, emission reduction technologies, um, I think there isn't, uh, again, there isn't one single answer. Um, I think if we look at the uh, short sea shipping, I think that there are uh, options out there that seem more viable. Uh, I think you've got electrification, uh, you've got hybridization, uh, along with fuel options such as hydrogen. Um, as well as the, 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 the breadth of other technologies. Um, however, I think the, the deep sea um, side of things is a much more difficult challenge, uh, particularly when you look at um, energy density, you look at the, the volumetric and, and gravimetric density of these alternate fuel options in particular, um, not to mention uh, when you wrap in the, the effects of their containment and storage systems, um, and you try and compare those with, with the uh, extremely um, fuel, uh, sorry, energy dense uh, option we have today with our standard fuels, and you start to understand the complexity of actually meeting uh, the operational needs of, of uh, deep sea shipping um, with these alternate technologies. Um, of course, on the efficiency side, there are a number of options, uh, you know, air lubrication of hulls, um, you know, um, waste heat use, even to a greater extent than we do at the moment. Um, and these all are a contribution to the answer, but unless you really uh, address the point of where the energy is coming from to propel the vessels, um, then, then we're certainly uh, not, not going to get anywhere near the 50% the uh, target, uh, or, or 100 as it, as it may now be. Um, so I don't think there are any uh, clear answers. I think when you're looking at the fuel, also you have to look at the whole pathway for that fuel um, to an extent. Um, so I think you have to consider the pathway and how the, the fuel has been uh, both uh, you know, refined or generated, uh, as well as its uh, then use uh, on board the vessel. However, also I think having said that, that we should be conscious to um, realize that actually adoption of some of these uh, technologies, even recognizing that currently uh, their pathways all the way through to use are not as green as they could be, uh, shouldn't necessarily be a reason for us to, to discount them um, because we should be considering that uh, things like uh, electrical generation, for instance, on land uh, that may be used to generate some of these, uh, these fuel sources um, will become greener over time. So I think we have to have a, a longer term look um, on those, uh, in those cases when you're looking at potentially you know, hydrogen for electrolysis, for instance, um, that may not be that green in, in sufficient quantity today, um, but may be part of the, the solution in the future. Thanks. Thanks, Dean. Very good. Very uh, comprehensive uh, answer. Maybe you guys have some thoughts uh, yourselves on what might be the, uh, the technologies and alternate fuels. Maybe I'll ask... Uh, uh, David, you're always ready with an opinion. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I, 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 I spoke to a journalist this morning that read an, uh, read an article that I wrote about um, your area, actually, the uh, alternate fuels. And I said uh, to him, what, what you're looking for uh, is for me to predict what bulk carriers are going to be operating on in 30 years' time. And we simply can't do that. Uh, and the reason we can't do that is we didn't go from Stevenson rocket to a nuclear-powered submarine in a single leap. You have to make some leaps. There are people that say LNG isn't a viable option because of the greenhouse impacts of methane slippage. But it might be our best option now. So why not adopt it now with the hope that further technology will come on and, and solve, solve problems? I think the, the difficulty is that we're looking for a, a solution that we can implement tomorrow that will solve all of our problems. And that's not how this is going to work. We're go it's going to be iterative. And there are going to be 
uh, solutions that work and there are going to be solutions that don't work. And unfortunately, uh, you know, living in a market world, there are going to be winners and, and losers in that. that that's just the, the, uh, the reality of it. But I also think there are certain things that we're not looking at that we could perhaps do immediately. So I come from an industry where, at sea, operationally, where we bought our own fuel. So we were obsessive about fuel burn to the point that we replaced all of the uh, incandescent light bulbs on board, or lamps as the, any electricians in the room would like to call them. Um, and we replaced them with LED technology. And we replaced them with LED technology when it was 20 pounds a lamp rather than uh, 20 pounds for 400 lamps in IKEA. And the reason we did that was because it, it, the, 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 the fuel saving over the life cycle of the lamp was such that we were still quids in at the end of it. The problem is with commercial shipping, we, most of it uh, um, occurs on the basis of we buy an asset and we loan it to other people on a contractual basis. You know, it's like a warehouse. In fact, if you look at a charter and a commercial warehouse uh, lease, there are lots of similarities between them. And part of the problem is that as an owner, we say our ship will burn 30 tonnes a day um, and two and a half tonnes in port. And we don't care whether that's actually an accurate figure of the most eff efficient way of running it, as long as it's within the scope of the, the market, because as long as we feel, fall within our speed and performance warranty, we're fine. What happens if uh, we start looking at that differently and we say, no, no, the charters will no longer buy the fuel, the fuel will be included in the cost of the hire. Then it becomes uh, incumbent on the owners to run their ships in the most efficient manner. Now, of course, there are two issues with that that owners will tell me immediately. The first is that fuel prices um, uh, alter. They alter for passenger ships too, and we just had a fuel price escalator in the ticket price. Uh, and it's much more difficult to go to a passenger and say, I want an extra 500 bucks for your holiday than it is to go to uh, you know, a trading house and say, I want an extra $500 to carry this grain cargo. This, the second point is um, the credit terms for buying fuel. So the charterers can negotiate much better uh, deals for buying bunker fuel. Th th those to me are problems that are easily solvable and probably solvable today because it's just a matter of uh, organization and contract drafting. I mean, f firstly, you, you mentioned LNG and the, the issue of methane slip, and I think it's we've got to not only, uh, again, it's a life cycle thing of the whole fuel because, uh, you know, methane slip all the way through the, the transport uh, chain uh, to get that fuel, actually, the point of then burning it um, when, when it's also then an option um, is an issue. Um, and I think it's a comparatively small amount of methane slip that has to occur across that whole chain before actually the, the environmental benefits are, uh, are negated. Um, uh, and then secondly, and just in terms of availability, again, uh, taking uh, LNG as an example, um, you know, you talk about that being maybe our best option today, um, and I, I can certainly see the, the arguments for that, um, but I think we also have to consider um, uh, that is a uh, fuel that may be ready, ready available to, to large shipping, um, but how do we deal with the, with the short shipping, where they can't access those, those fuels uh, as readily? So I think that's a, a challenge facing, facing that sector. I think we should dwell on this uh, question a little bit more, and I, I would like uh, George's views also, because I think uh, what I was, uh, uh, what I feel is the current view on this topic in terms of 2050 targets is that two thirds of the problem solving has to come from alternate fuels if we are to keep two, C, two degrees C, and therefore this is the heart of our uh, question if we are going to go get anywhere near the 50% and maybe even the, even the 100%. So, I mean, George, tell I me. I know that uh, what everybody expects to hear is about uh, fuel cell engines and alternative fuels and all that, and I hate to be a party pooper, but at least between now and 2030, we can achieve what we need to achieve based on uh, uh, very low sulfur or uh, LNG, and uh, allegedly for a large number of vessels, that can extend even to the mid-2030s. So, Currently, what we see in uh, the market is, uh, let's say, a uh, landscape of evolution uh, rather than revolution in what has to, in what has to do with uh, marine engines. We see a lot of refinement. We see a lot of improvements uh, on uh, the existing technologies. And uh, 
a lot of uh, companies solving the issues uh, associated with methane sleep and all that, so minimizing them or addressing them. And I think this is what uh, we will see. This is what will take our industry into the uh, 2030s. And uh, of course, then, we all have to move into the uh, carbon-free uh, propulsion, uh, as we like to say, or uh, uh, any neutral or hybrid uh, solution. But uh, in order for this to be developed, there needs to be market demand. And uh, for somebody to take uh, a technology like this to the readiness level that uh, will allow its adoption on, onto the general field, they need to know that their investment will return within five or within 10 years, and that there will be this broad demand that uh, will justify uh, the investment. Uh, the great availability of options being considered uh, at the moment and uh, the uncertainty as to what uh, the target values will be in uh, the middle of the next decade or as we approach the 2040s, I think kind of delays uh, all these ideas from uh, materializing. I think that uh, we all understand how difficult it is to get consensus on, uh, on a long-term roadmap uh, for emissions, but uh, until we are uh, in uh, such a position, I mean, not achieving targets if this happens uh, will not be an issue of not having the available technology. It will either be the issue of uh, slipping down the line in terms of uh, making the final decisions, or it will be an issue of cost, especially for the smaller uh, ship owners. And I'm not talking about the cost-benefit uh, relationship as with selecting uh, the right type of scrubber, but uh, the, the sheer cost of uh, upgrading an asset, uh, uh, let's say, later in its life, and uh, the, whether the availability of uh, the most optimum uh, propulsion system or fuel at the area and operation model of that vessel uh, will be there or not. So this is uh, how I see it. But George, I, I George and uh, David and Dean, I think listening to you guys, I can see some subtly different uh, dynamics of what might be the right thing and uh, uh, maybe we should uh, uh, kind of uh, amplify those differences during the, the discussion later but I, I do think that the, uh, the low carbon fuel uh, will be the absolute key to solving this problem so is it sensible for us to say this is the, this is the place where we want to be and most of the investments are going to last 25 years let's put all the intellectual power of the of the industry to solving that particular topic and i think uh, uh, in in the sense that uh, hydrogen for example or uh, ammonia uh, is it hydrogen or is it ammonia is it and and getting that green and i think you've been working on some projects where we are trying to suck onshore renewables to produce green hydrogen on a barge for a port to help ferries yeah, uh, really addressing yeah. that that ready availability of the of the fuel at the point of requirement. Um, yeah. But yeah, and again, that's a great example of where it's a it's a solution that is, um, you know, maybe accepting that that energy supply is not as green as it could be today. Today, yeah. But, but is uh, something that, that would hopefully foster the adoption of the fuel um, to be ready at the point at which when it was. Yeah. Yeah. But. Uh, I would love to hear more from uh, from you guys on uh, on this uh, topic. So, if we now move to the kind of third question we had, which is uh, uh, actually it, it has no direct impact on the IMO uh, targets because ports and harbors are national, and therefore their emissions and uh, uh, their own own problems that are controlled by the net zero assumptions of the uh, or commitments of the governments. So. What I want to know here is that how does, uh, how, what are the things that ports and harbors can do that could help to minimize and reduce the emissions uh, from uh, vessels that serve them? Maybe we kick off with you, uh, George, since you are ready to run. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Akila. So uh, the first uh, issue that has to do with ports, of course, is uh, whether they can be of assistance uh, to the rest of shipping for uh, interest of decarbonizing. And uh, there is a very good way in which, uh, in fact, uh, they can be. And uh, the evident, the obvious answer that uh, you would mention first is uh, cold ironing. But uh, this is uh, just the tip of the iceberg. 
uh, I believe that all ports uh, should be developing uh, this type of facility. And it's understandable at the same time that uh, this will require investment. But uh, currently, in most cases, uh, it is not there. Uh, another uh, reason that, another way in which uh, ports can help is uh, by uh, entering a just-in-time uh, space. So by joining an integrated system where vessels that uh, are traveling towards a port can be getting real-time updates on how the operations at the port uh, are going and when is the best estimate for their required arrival time. That means that uh, by slow steaming so that they arrive just in time and not two days uh, earlier having to stay at Anchorage, and especially considering also the uh, way in which we are accounting for emissions, which penalizes emissions with uh, the vessel at standstill, uh, it, it is uh, an excellent way and can be an effective way uh, to lower emissions in shipping through the integration with ports. Obviously, there are a lot of challenges associated with that, and uh, having and maintaining this interconnectivity uh, between uh, port and vessels, then uh, security and uh, cyber security in particular becomes a major issue. Uh, also, the uptake of the technology and uh, how well it can uh, really work on the different types of vessels and uh, the different regions uh, globally is an issue. But uh, I would think that, uh, especially in our part of the world, it can uh, be a good contributor and it can have a good, uh, uh, we have a good starting point, let's say, to work with. And we know that big European ports are at the moment looking at uh, uh, the benefits and uh, the potential of implementing uh, such a system. The second important role uh, ports uh, have in uh, emissions, of course, is that uh, any alternative fuels that uh, we will find ourselves as an industry using uh, in the next uh, 10, 15, uh, 20 years, they will have to be available and uh, bunkered uh, in the different ports. Currently, the landscape doesn't look like one where uh, somebody sh should expect that every port everywhere in the world would have the same options, and uh, which options uh, in themselves will be suitable for the different vessel types, the different vessel sizes. The operating uh, regions and operating profiles will also vary significantly. So it will be a logistical challenge for ports to find the investment, which if there is demand, we believe that especially for fuel availability, it will be there. But at the same time, find the space and the, the supply chains to be able to accommodate uh, the alternative fuels that will be appropriate to the uh, part of the world where they are, the type of operations that uh, they service and uh, then play the key part in uh, this equation. But uh, actually, you've touched on a very interesting, uh, interesting question, because as, as um, uh, the port infrastructure may not be, uh, have the, uh, the real estate, uh, and Dean, you've, you've been looking at this problem uh, on a, on a real-life project now, aren't you? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. So we're, we're going to be working with a, a UK port to, to, to see how we could address that um, availability of space and, and fuel infrastructure. Um, uh, and that's going to be a really interesting project to actually look at the uh, look at the requirements in terms of capacity um, and the, both the environmental and, and economic case for, for investing in some of these infrastructure projects in a in a in a typical uh, in our case UK port uh, environment. So um, that that is a project that will be getting underway shortly. I'm I'm interested, George, in one of one of the points you made actually about the just in time principle. Mm -hmm. um, whilst you mentioned a couple of the challenges around just the implementation of that. Um, you know, to me, I can see that the, the value in having that with, uh, with today's fuels and technologies in terms of a fuel saving. Um, so I'm interested in your thoughts about why maybe people haven't been incentivized to date to implement such a solution. Um, and I know maybe it's something that, that David has a thought on too. I think that uh, George is ready. at uh, this point it is uh, the complexity in uh, uptaking such a solution and uh, having uh, the providers that uh, can supply a universal uh, system that can be installed, readily installed uh, on vessels uh, and uh, have them participate uh, in this initiative. It will not happen overnight, obviously. It will be gradual. Again, we expect to see this type of uh, investment and the early adopters to be the larger operators, as uh, they are the ones that uh, have the most to benefit uh, out of uh, such an option uh, anyway. 
but uh, indeed with uh, the levels of instrumentation that uh, we are seeing at uh, SIPS uh, today and uh, the way that uh, SIPS connectivity has improved, especially over the past uh, 10 years, it's uh, something that, uh, let's say, at uh, the start of the previous decade uh, would sound extremely difficult to achieve and we are now reaching a point where we can talk about a good coverage and being able to implement <laughs> such a system on, uh, on a vessel that does continental uh, uh, George, just before, uh, a quick one, uh, price, what is the price? That, is it a 5% improvement or 25% improvement through this? And, uh, and uh, just it, give me a quick answer so we can then it press again on. It will depend on the port, so uh, the, the larger, uh, more congesting, uh, congested uh, ports, like uh, for instance uh, Rotterdam or Hamburg, somebody that's uh, calling regularly to those ports will see a greater benefit. Uh, consumption has a cubic relationship with uh, speed, so knowing that, for instance, uh, you need to be present at a particular port uh, one or two days uh, uh, later than uh, what you are accounting for, it may allow you to run at uh, lower speeds and yeah. uh, potentially uh, save uh, 5, 10, 15 percent uh, over the overall journey. So. Okay. Understood. Understood. I always want an easy answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> David, do you have any thoughts on this topic? To do with smart arrival times. Smart arrival times or any other contributions that uh, 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 Port and so Harbour authorities, managers uh, can make to overall vessel emission reductions. So, there are, so dealing with the smart arrival times first, yeah. we, we've played around with this kind of issue before with virtual arrivals during right. the 2008 um, global downturn. Um, and there are two key issues that I see with this. The first is that I'm afraid fuel is significantly cheaper than time. Yeah. And if you're a charter paying for fuel or time, um, especially at the moment, I, I don't know whoever, uh, if there are any ship brokers out there, to $200,000 a day for some container ships at the moment, as yeah. opposed to maybe a maximum fuel burn of $20,000 a day, you can see the imperative of getting there to get alongside quicker. Uh, the other issue is, uh, with the uh, total lack of sophistication of any cyber protection at sea, yeah. uh, th this is really where a cyber attack is going to take place. The idea that some 13-year-old boy in Basildon is going to take over a ship's ECDIS system and run it aground it is fanciful, and it's always been ridiculous in my view. But the idea of someone actually hacking into the port of Rotterdam's computers to slow things down and then ransoming people is, is perhaps a very, very real one. So I think okay. that's, a, that's an issue that um, they, they need to think about. But I think that the, the final point, I'll make it quick because I know everyone's thirsty, yeah. but the ports have got a real issue in terms of their investment. We don't pay very much to uh, use them. They don't get an awful lot of public money to support them, uh, particularly the private owned ones. They have millions of pounds to invest in sea defences as sea levels rise because it, it ports are by definition going to be the, 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 the first part of our infrastructure yeah. that faces that problem and if you're competing with relatively lo low turnovers and having to spend huge amounts of money to ensure that your business can operate as the weather patterns change and sea level rises where's your money going to go is it going to go into of finding an extra um, bit of land for you to put an extra uh, fuel system in, probably not, because that's not essential to your business. I mean, it, it might be, and some of the better funded ports might actually might feel be. that it's a, it, it's a commercial imperative for them to, to be greener, but yeah. some of the smaller ports are really going to struggle. Yeah. Good. I think, uh, thank you, I, uh, I think what I uh, feel this panel has been is that there has been some quite uh, subtly different points having been made here and uh, I can see some uh, divergences of opinion. So I think I'm now going to throw it open to the, to the uh, floor for questions on any of the three topics and I think we'll start with you actually. You're, you asked a question <coughs> about 100%, can we get to 100%? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so the first one is, say, the um, UK government Monday said the I think the target work with the IMO longer a bit percent reduction by 2050 to 100 percent reduction. They're not the first ones to have come up with this idea. We have COP26 coming up. Who knows that many? Then more behind it. That remains a risk. Uh, 
how you think, um, how will I clear the problem like that. My other question is to do relates to LNG. It strikes me that the chief advantages for LNG are its PR and its marketing. Um, it already really achieves a 20 to 30 percent cut in carbon, uh, and it new things on like 80 times more potent than carbon. Um, there is increasing uh, talk about the prospects of struggles to cut carbon by 20 to 30 percent. That bypasses the whole issue of methane. Could there be an unexpected second wind for high sulfur fuel oil? High sulfur fuel oil. Actually, that's a even more subtle question, actually, because of the cooling effect. So yes, okay. So um, I think the, I, I don't want to walk into that particular Maya. So I'm going to get my <laughs> colleagues here to do so. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I thought you were really provoking that. Pro this is pro provocation. So perhaps we. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, so, so the, the first question was the, the uh, UK government is now saying that IMO ought to target 100% reduction over 2008 by, um, uh, by 2050, uh, effectively doubling the ambition. Uh, and your question is, is that possible or is this just uh, PR? Um, who would like to? Uh, I presume. Uh, ah, good, I David. Presume. Yeah. You're the man. I presume that their target is British registered ships, is it? Global fleet. Global fleet. Yeah. Wow. That, that is ambitious. Yes. But, I, yeah, okay. I think the thing is that if you, uh, what we have learned from the conversation, at least what I've learned from the conversation, is that I think if you uh, have a, a suite of uh, weapons in your hand, to do so, and they are consistently applied, that they, they reinforce each other rather than work against them, uh, it is possible to do this. And that also includes some kind of uh, carbon price that actually adjusts that price to such an extent that it is inevitable that you will have to cut your emissions. And why am I saying this? Uh, because I, I spent most of my life in oil and gas. Some of you might have noticed when um, uh, Biden made the announcement for various increases in offshore wind, uh, one small line was slipped out. And that small line was that we will also stop subsidizing fossil fuels, if you remember. So 150 years after that uh, industry started, we are still discussing the question of subsidy removal. So we maintained a, a particular energy system that we felt had a global uh, benefit by inevitably rigging that market, if you pardon my extreme phrase. And I'm, I'm only asking from my optimistic view of life is that in the carbon dioxide question, we also need to do the same. We can't simply say it's all, the game is open and we all have to fight uh, in the marketplace without any there's adjustments. A, there's an economics professor at, I think he's at Oxford, called Dieter Helm, who's yes. written three excellent books, yes. The Carbon Crunch, Fossil Fuel End Game, and How to Stop Climate Change was his 20, September 2020 um, book. And uh, he's quite pessimistic. So I've been reading quite a lot of this recently. Bill Gates thinks that everyone, everything, uh, as long as we have the ambition, we'll, we'll get yeah. there. So if you want a I'm positive read uh, on climate change, that you're not going to go away thinking that we're, we're, we're all doomed, yes. Bill Gates' book is the one to go for. Yeah. Um, but Dieter Helm said that the, the, the issue that we face with decarbonisation is that it's free to stick CO2 and greenhouse gases yeah. into the atmosphere. Until and until we get, grapple with that issue, yeah, which is and the polluter pay exactly yeah, the polluter, polluter pay. Pays. So uh, that's what I was about to, to say. Y your your principle is wrapped up into his single snappy phrase: the polluter pays. Yes. Um, um, by polluter, I think he means that all of us pay. Which comes back to my point, which is, if you think that life isn't going to get more expensive as part of this journey, y you are deluding yourself. And I don't mean more expensive business. I mean more expensive to our our own pockets. So is the answer to the question, yes, we can, to, if you pardon my stealing the big phrase, uh, yes, we can, or no? 
<laughs> Maybe a quick answer, uh, because we need to move on to the other questions as well. You know yeah. very well that uh, I'm as optimistic about the capabilities of our industry as uh, anybody can be, and uh, I'm a true believer of decarbonization and the fact that uh, we will achieve it. Now, the answer on whether shipping can be carbon-free uh, by uh, 2050, uh, that would be a hard no. Not because of technology, not uh, because of uh, people's willingness or uh, even investment, but because of the way the world is uh, structured. Even if uh, we could uh, fit uh, alternative uh, power uh, units uh, to all vessels in the world, we would not be able to make the bunker available everywhere. I mean, most of us are familiar with uh, our side of the world, which is a quite privileged uh, and advanced, but especially certain categories of vessels like bulk carriers uh, trade uh, in or with or between the poorest uh, parts of this world. And uh, to assume that uh, because of a political decision uh, in less than 30 years from now, all these parts of the world will be able to supply uh, alternative fuels and uh, support, let's say, uh, or service modernized shipping is, uh, is not realistic. George, it's, I'm so sad. I'm so sad. It's, it's, it's excellent for somebody to put it on the table as a negotiating uh, suggestion, because we need to start high if we are to achieve something more than uh, what is being debated at the moment, and it's quite noble uh, as such. But uh, uh, as a viable proposition, I, I wouldn't really... Uh, so you're on the no camp. <laughs> Dean? Uh, I, I think it'd be incredibly challenging, but I think we should try. Uh, s similar to your last point, there, <laughs> to George, really, is, is that uh, you know, in, unless we, you know, if, if we sit back on on models that say we don't need to do anything until 2035, mm -hmm. we'll miss 2050. And if aiming at 100% means that we we move away from that and, uh, and actually look at what we can do today, then I would support it. Yeah. And were you yes or no on that? <laughs> I don't yeah. think with it, the it, polluter pays. Yeah. Are you okay with it? I don't think it's possible, and I think there are better targets which will which will are more yeah. achievable, Pessimists which will yield, yield better <laughs> better shipping is what two percent of the world's emissions, whereas carbon uh, steel manufactures something like sixteen, and agriculture yes. is you know. But, so there are. But the situation is that uh, the net zero commitments from countries means that shipping's emissions, if they are not uh, mitigated is going to be a higher proportion. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and, we, and if, the, if you have growth in shipping, then you are in really... Uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do anything. Totally. But, yeah. but what I'm saying is that it, 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 um, it comes back to where you're going to get most bang for your buck. One of the, I think your second question was to do with, uh, is LNG, have they been really good at PR? <laughs> Mm. Um, really, I, I, I don't know uh, whether there are there are anybody there's anybody who's been. Uh, I haven't uh, looked at this Watsila uh, idea, but uh, maybe Dean, you can not, I? Not, not something I'm familiar with, but I think yeah. we uh, we would have to. Um, you know, it's the same issue with the scrubbers generally. I mean, what do you do with it? What's after you've scrubbed it out of the gases? What do you do with it? Um, and how, you know, does it just become another environmental problem? Um, so I think that's a, a, an, an example maybe where. Uh, targets uh, and legislation can get things wrong in terms of incentivizing the wrong behaviors as well. You could use it to create an Yes. The, uh, okay. the issue at uh, this point uh, is not that uh, there is no uh, carbon capture technology. Uh, the big problem in adopting it uh, onto ships at the time is that uh, to store the amount of liquid you would have to run through the scrubber uh, to capture the CO2 and then store it until you can recycle it would probably need as much space if not more than your normal bunker. So it's so what do you land based on, uh, on your carbon space. Yeah. I think there are some land based examples where they're they're capturing the carbon and as you say using it to generate yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, David, do you have any thoughts on this? No. So uh, the, uh, maybe I'll throw it open to a great uh, specialist on this topic here who might want to comment. You mean I'm delaying the drinks? 
I'm, so, I'm really sorry. Really sorry. Um, uh, really sorry. But uh, any, anybody who wants to comment on this? Because I think those are really nice questions. Well, yeah, from please. From the Exhaust Gas Cleaning Systems Association, so several of the members are working on technologies using liquid to dissolve carbon dioxide into the exhaust gas stream. Okay. So that bit is relatively straightforward. I think as an oil industry, you know about those sorts yes. of amines and things that can do yes. that. But as you say, there's going to be quite a volume of it. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Any any other questions yeah, on things? Question yes, on please go for it. Obviously, it's a hugely complex subject <laughs> with the, you know, the manufacture of ships, the operation, and the recycling. And when something it's this huge, I think it's always best to tackle it in bite-sized chunks. So I want the guys to get off the fence. Imagine they've got the power of the IMO and the EU. Thank you to all the people that voted this out of the EU. And, um, <laughs> and the US Coast Guard. What would be the first bite-sized chunk you'd like to implement? Uh, Cross-border carbon taxes. Great. Yes. The answer's concise, That's exactly. no waffle. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> George. Exactly. Not, uh, not having it free. And uh, I think that... Uh, reinvesting this into cleaner technologies would be a trade-off which uh, would be a tangible or basically creating a grant out of it uh, for smaller ship owners to be able to tap into as a loan uh, so that they could uh, let's say catch up on the upgrades uh, gain uh, it may be a bit on the romantic side but uh, that's how i would see uh, <laughs> but I think the cross-border, that'll, that'll capture, the, uh, that could be the trigger point through which other things will happen. Yeah? And, um, you, sir. Dean? You, sir. Me? <laughs> Me. <laughs> I'm only chairing. I don't know anything about the subject. Uh, Dean, maybe? Um, I, I agree, but I'd like to see that investment then made into the port infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. I think my answer, uh, actually, I was thinking carbon capture when uh, David, uh, it's not carbon capture, carbon pricing, because I introduced the point about it, because I think that uh, 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 there's a massive con that's been going on for many years, because people, uh, because I, when I first started getting into the renewables industry, first I was called in, I mean, the recycling industry, and then uh, the, the whole point was that there was this pump of the established industries that said this is, we are actually standing up without any support. Uh, you subsidy junkies are coming in and uh, uh, destroying us. Uh, the, the truth is much more subtle. And I think the, the uh, and we made, I, I'm not saying that it was wrong what happened, because actually the energy system that we transitioned from coal actually needed some of that subsidization in order to actually make the globe better. Now that we have discovered there was a cost to it, we should take that cost and get it moving. And uh, I'm still optimistic that ultimately that, that cost also involves productivity improvements, efficiency improvements, electrification, and so on. And I'm still optimistic that eventually we may not be as uh, expensive as uh, David worries. Good. Any other questions? I think I'm getting the instruction to close it down because people can't wait. They're thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. I really uh, am uh, grateful for your <laughs> attention, and uh, I hope uh, it was interesting and uh, that you will... Uh, 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 ponder some of these questions in your mind. Uh, at least I think one of the most important things when you are in a hole is to stop digging. And I think we are actually starting to stop digging. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you.